uh, as as you implied, I am really uh, a part of the family. I've been uh, involved with uh, IAD for for many many years. Uh, I don't know how many conferences organized by AID I I participated in, but um, it it must be in the dozens. Well, anyway, what I would like to do today, as you see the uh, the title on the screen is to ask the following question. Will Africa follow a different development model than the rest of the developing uh, world? And uh, I, I think that you will conclude at the end of my presentation that the answer to this question is not yet entirely clear, but that in all likelihood, uh, Africa will follow a, uh, a different model. So uh, let me just very briefly go into the main messages and the content uh, of the presentation. Um, probably the starting point is a quote from the uh, uh, London Economist, Africa's development model puzzles economists. Um, they've had a number of uh, articles in which uh, they kept raising the question without really uh, answering it. So what I'm going to try to do today is uh, first describe the main features of what I call the traditional development model, the model that has been followed historically uh, ever since the uh, mid uh, 20th century. Um, particularly by the very early uh, growers, Taiwan and uh, South Korea, but then copied by many other countries. Then I will try to uh, compare and contrast this model with what is now the emerging development model in Africa. I'll describe the main features of uh, this development model and then I'll end up by raising some concerns about the uh, ultimate viability uh, of the uh, African model. So again, the, uh, if we look at the traditional and historical model since the mid-50s, it originated in East Asia, South Korea and Taiwan then was followed by a number of countries, China, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, more recently uh, a South Asia, in particular uh, India, Bangladesh, uh, Latin America, and of course there are some differences between the Latin American historical model, which at first was very protectionistic, but then became less so uh, as uh, they uh, went on. Okay, so what are the main features of the traditional development uh, model? Uh, the first one is what has been called agricultural development led industrialization that first you have to provide the possibility for agriculture to increase its productivity, land, labor productivity, uh, so that it can provide some kind of a surplus which would be available to the incipient uh, industrial sector. So this is one of the features. Second feature is a smooth and gradual structural transformation. Uh, in just a few minutes, I'll define what I mean by structural transformation. Still another feature is that the, the main uh, force, the main engine of growth that uh, propelled the countries uh, that were successful were exports. Still another feature is that the successful countries learn by doing, uh, looking, copying, think of reverse engineering. Uh, still another one is that they climbed the uh, product ladder, 
in a very gradual and systematic way, one rung at a time. Uh, there have been very few uh, examples of successful uh, uh, leap frogging so that you could go from the lowest uh, rung to the third or fourth uh, rung. And uh, uh, the movement, as you can see, was from simple labor intensive uh, products to highly sophisticated capital and brain intensive uh, products. And in this sense, each country followed its comparative, its dynamic comparative advantage. And then a final feature that I will talk about a little bit is what has been called the flying geese development model. So what about agricultural development led uh, industrialization? Um, at a very early stage of development, all countries are essentially agrarian. The great bulk of the labor force, as well as the great bulk of the output, uh, originates in uh, agriculture. And as the country starts to uh, grow, agriculture becomes more productive, and it becomes important for the agricultural workers that can be released from agriculture to find jobs, employment opportunities outside of agriculture that have a higher productivity so that uh, GDP can uh, grow. Um, in, and, and this is what we call the structural transformation. It's, uh, it's the intersectoral dynamic process whereby over time countries that started as essentially ag agrarian uh, gradually became industrialized or service countries, and agriculture became a, a, a minor a sector. So the uh, traditional model uh, basically took the, the policy view that in order to uh, um, propel development, it was very important to nurture agriculture. And again, the prime examples of this would be Taiwan and South Korea. And this was done through a combination of uh, uh, improving infrastructure, uh, research on uh, higher yielding varieties, farmers' institution, educating the children of farmers so that they would have the skills that were needed outside of agriculture. And as uh, workers became more productive, uh, some of them could be released. And as I hinted before, uh, this provided a kind of an agricultural surplus, uh, a kind of finance that could be used to start the incipient industrial process. And here, as a, as a quick footnote, uh, one of the major, if not the major architect of this concept uh, was T.H. Lee, the former president of Taiwan, who got his PhD in agricultural economics um, at, uh, at Cornell. So there's an interesting uh, link here that uh, is worth mentioning. So where is this uh, agricultural devel development-led industrialization seem to have worked in the uh, traditional model uh, we do not see it happening, or at least until very re recently, in Africa. Uh, the, uh, in, in Africa, most of the farmers are small scale and subsistence farmers, uh, yet there's also an export crop sector. So in this sense, it's a dualistic agricultural uh, sector. And, uh, Early on, and by this I mean essentially from the time of uh, independence until about uh, 2000, uh, many, many African governments, ex instead of nurturing agriculture, uh, tended to exploit uh, agriculture uh, 
um, by taxing it, by turning the terms of trade against agriculture, and using those proceeds essentially to keep the prices of food low so that the urban dwellers were satisfied. And that was important politically because the constituencies of many of these governments were not in agriculture, but were in the uh, uh, urban areas. Um, and it's only in the really last decade that we see some uh, major changes in the uh, approach to uh, uh, agriculture in, in Africa. So what is a structural transformation? Uh, it's, as I pointed out, as countries grow, the share of labor force in agriculture falls, as does the share of agricultural output in uh, GDP. And uh, in turn, the share of industry and services in GDP and the labor force uh, rises. And it's one of the most regular process that uh, we can find uh, in the uh, uh, development uh, 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 economic uh, uh, process. So here, um, I'm illustrating it by way of uh, um, cross-sectional data from a large number of countries. And on the vertical axis, you have respectively the share of labor in agriculture and the share of agriculture in GDP. Um, and on the horizontal axis, you have essentially per capita income. It's a log of per capita income, but it's essentially per capita income. So what you see is happening is that countries with very high shares of the labor force and GDP uh, in uh, uh, the, of agriculture and the total labor force tend to have very low per capita income. And as that share comes down, uh, GDP per capita goes up. And it's cross-sectionally at least, uh, it, it's, a, it's a rather uh, dramatic demonstration of what is happening in this uh, structural uh, transformation. Um, don't worry about the. Don't worry about this, this, and this quadrant. Just concentrate on this quadrant if you can see it. This would be the uh, time uh, arrow uh, of a large number of successful Asian countries. So basically, this would be the, uh, the beginning point, probably in uh, maybe around uh, 1970 all the way to maybe 2005 for a given country. And what you see is that the time path, um, the arrows, are very consistent with the type of structural transformation that I showed you uh, cross-sectionally. So this is what we would call a, a successful structural transformation. And it is successful because as the share of uh, agricultural workers in the labor force comes down, GDP increases, which means that as the workers are released from agriculture, they find more productive jobs uh, outside of agriculture. Now, contrast this with uh, Africa, and most of the countries here are from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. What you see is a very flawed structural transformation. Many of these time arrows are almost vertical, which indicates what? Well, it indicates that as workers are moved out or pushed out of agriculture, they are not getting more productive jobs outside of agriculture. So where do they end up? They end up in a, a giant parking lot that you could call the, uh, the informal sector, um, 
there is no growth, no GDP growth. Um, it's essentially, as I will point out in a minute, uh, a, a migration of uh, misery. So what, what can we uh, conclude? Uh, I think what we can conclude is that whereas Asia, uh, East Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, went through a successful structural transformation, Africa until recently had a very flawed one. Uh, until the early 2000s, workers were in Africa were pushed out of agriculture rather than pulled into more productive agricultural jobs. And that's what I mean by migration of uh, uh, misery. OK, um, before going on, let me just mention that very broadly, if you look at uh, Africa, and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we can denote three uh, periods, uh, three stages of uh, growth. The first stage from about 1960 to 2000 was essentially complete growth stagnation. Um, if you want to see something scary, the uh, uh, annual growth rate of GDP per capita, let's say income per capita, was essentially zero. The annual, so absolutely no growth over a 40-year period. Uh, this, of course, led to large increases in poverty and uh, uh, income inequality. And then it was followed by a second period, roughly from 2000 to 2015, where a major growth spurt occurred. The annual growth rate per capita within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was between 3 and 4% a year, which is phenomenal. We can really talk about a quantum jump in economic growth in this uh, period. The poverty headcount ratio fell from something like 58% in 1998 to 41% in 2013. And even the total number of poor fell. So there is evidence, and I can't go into this in any detail, that the, that pattern of growth was becoming more uh, inclusive. And then largely because of the fall in uh, world commodity prices, the third stage, which started around 2015, uh, has uh, brought up a slowdown uh, in annual uh, growth, again, per capita, of around uh, 1%. And, and again, there is some evidence that uh, there might be a, a restart of growth, but uh, it's, it's too early to really tell. OK, now I don't want to be technical, but uh, uh, um, I think it's important to just mention two points here. Uh, based on 90 demographic and health, health surveys covering 24 uh, African uh, countries between 93 and 2011, um, two conclusions were reached. One was that the structural transformation was a drag on the economy-wide productivity until about 2000, but that it contributed about half of the labor productivity growth during the period 2000 to uh, 2011. And secondly, that the recent pattern from about 2000 on um, is, is uh, conforms much more to the uh, successful structural transformation that occurred in uh, uh, Asia long before. Okay, so I'm getting now to the second feature of the traditional model, which is ex export propelled growth. And and again, if you anybody who has looked at the history, at the economic history of uh, 
Korea and Taiwan realizes that growth played, I mean, the export played a, uh, a major role in, uh, in growth. And uh, gradually, uh, this export-led growth was also uh, followed by s southeastern countries, particularly Indonesia, and uh, more recently, South Asia and uh, Latin America. And here, think of the unbelievable success of, uh, of China. I still remember uh, a few years ago when the rate of growth of exports was not something like 15, 20 percent a year. Uh, the Chinese were really quite disappointed. It was a phenomenal increase in, uh, uh, in exports. And partially as a result of this, uh, China has started to uh, saturate uh, the uh, global markets for a number of consumer and even uh, capital goods. Um, Africa lagged behind for many reasons. And I think one very important reason is what has been called the resource curse, uh, the reliance on uh, mining, mineral, and oil exports. Um, it's a little bit like uh, going back to uh, the 17th century. Uh, uh, Spain and Portugal uh, had quite a bit of gold and made it a point of trying to get as much gold as possible. And as a consequence, they did not have to really provide uh, the domestic goods, and partially for exports, uh, that would have helped the, uh, uh, the growth. It was what was called the mercantilist uh, uh, period. So having uh, these natural resources, um, it, it provides uh, an excuse to a government for not really doing the kinds of things that are needed to start the, uh, uh, the growth uh, process. And also, it's a, a scope for enormous waste and uh, corruption. And the Dutch disease, I don't want to go into the Dutch disease, but the Dutch disease essentially is that when you have natural resources, um, it's going to work against agriculture. The terms of trade will move against agriculture, and there will be no strong incentives to uh, promote uh, agriculture. OK, uh, still another feature of the uh, traditional model, uh, climbing the product ladder one rung at a time. And I, uh, at my age, uh, I no longer have graduate students. I no longer have a secretary. Uh, um, I, I, I have to be very self-reliant. And I was trying to find a ladder. You know, you, you have uh, this, this whole, uh, 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 it, it, on your computer, it, it gives you shapes and forms and so on. For the life of me, I was not able to find a ladder. <laughs> so just. Just imagine, just imagine that there is a ladder. The, the progression typically was from very labor intensive, very simple commodities, uh, canned vegetables, to labor intensive apparel and garment, uh, textiles, synthetic fibers, uh, wood products, uh, and so on, electric, electronic, uh, machinery, chemical materials and so on. And, and the point is that those countries that were successful would really climb this ladder one rung at a time. I think I've already mentioned that leapfrogging has not worked. I still remember being in Indonesia in the 90s, and uh, uh, the government was just embarking on trying to uh, start a uh, um, uh, an industry to uh, uh, build planes. Well, it was a total failure. The point about climbing this ladder one rung at a time is that the workers and the entrepreneurs learn by doing, uh, learn by looking, uh, get additional skills, get additional human capital, and are able to move to the uh, 
uh, the next uh, run. Now, this did not uh, happen uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think partially because of the big uh, handicap that they faced uh, following the colonial trade pattern. For essentially centuries, uh, African, uh, African countries had been colonies uh, of uh, France, Belgium, Portugal, you name it. And the trade pattern that evolved was an exchange of natural resources from the periphery to the import of uh, manufactured goods from the uh, colonial powers. And essentially, this ingrained pattern, which was in a way part of the DNA institutions were there that had been built on this pattern, continued throughout the 20th century. And it's essentially only during the, uh, the growth spell of 2000 to 2015 that some significant changes uh, occurred. And as I'm going to go into very shortly, um, there were a number of uh, uh, new outlets, such as uh, horticulture, uh, flowers, um, including uh, ICTs, uh, which have been called industries without smokestacks, that developed in uh, uh, Africa. So a new pattern of structural transformation is emerging, and it's quite different from the traditional manufacturing uh, led transformation that uh, we just uh, described. OK, what is the final feature that I just want to uh, mention here? Um, it's what has been called the flying geese uh, pattern. Um, the uh, earliest developers, uh, Taiwan and South Korea, were much influenced by the uh, technological and institutional know-how of uh, Japan. So they essentially learned and adopted many of the Japanese technologies, many of the Japanese institutions, and, and you have what may Again, this may not be, look, be looking like a flying geese, but you have one leader, Japan, and then two sub-leaders, and so on, so that you have a flock of geese uh, essentially uh, following the lead uh, goose. Now, could it be, I'm raising this as a question, and I want to be very careful in answering it, but could it be that China is now the leading goose pulling and directing the uh, African uh, gooseling? Now, some of you may say, well, isn't it gosling? And, and it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, no, no, but I, I learned something which I didn't know. Uh, a gooseling is a cross between a duck and a goose. And a uh, gosling is a straight offspring of, uh, of geese. So I chose this word very carefully, because it's conceivable that uh, this type uh, of uh, mixture uh, might create some, uh, some uh, real uh, problems. But before concluding this, what are the implications of Africa becoming a gooseling of China? First, undoubtedly, there are some real advantages. Uh, China has uh, an enormous amount of experience in building large-scale physical infrastructure, which is absolutely crucial uh, in Africa. Um, and uh, the technological know-how and uh, entrepreneurial skills, in some respects, uh, may 
better fit the initial conditions of Africa than more advanced technologies. And still another very important factor here would be capital, the inflow of capital that comes with uh, uh, China's uh, uh, trade and, and, and China's interest in, uh, uh, in African uh, natural resources. But there are also some, some very high risks. Uh, the exploitation of African natural resources through contracts focusing on the short run uh, at the cost of uh, the long-term national interests of these, uh, of these countries. And I've, I've often mentioned to Muna that this would be a, a very interesting area of research for economists and lawyers to really look at these uh, contracts to see to what extent uh, uh, at least some of the African countries uh, were uh, compromising the long-term national interest by entering into short-term contracts, uh, which while in the short run were beneficial, but would have a very high cost in losing control over these uh, uh, natural uh, resources. And of course, there's enormous scope for uh, corruption. Uh, land grabbing um, is still a, uh, an issue. And uh, incidentally, not just from uh, China, uh, Prince Mohammed, who was visiting the Vi White House uh, yesterday, um, some accounts say that he owns half of Ethiopia. Now, that's, that's of course an exaggeration. But his, his mother is Ethiopian. I have stayed in, in probably the most luxurious hotel I've ever stayed in my life in Addis that was built by uh, uh, Prince uh, Mo. Um, and uh, the uh, problem here could be that uh, uh, some of the African countries, and Ethiopia being one of them, could uh, become uh, gigantic farms producing uh, uh, rice. Uh, and, and there's a, a typo here, but essentially uh, rice uh, for Saudi Arabia. Uh, then in contrast uh, with uh, the East, Asia flying geese, there is little shared cultural bonds and affinity between China, between China and uh, Africa. So these are really the, uh, the risks in this uh, relationship. Conclusions. First, I think it's clear that the African development model is very different from the traditional model. Secondly, it is too early to define clearly what this development model may become uh, in the future, but it's very unlikely to be based on industrialization. Africa is too much of a latecomer, and the global market for most goods has now been saturated. Um, Africa cannot uh, leapfrog to brain industries uh, a la Musk. So, the, the best hope is that Africa will find its appropriate niche in the global value change. And uh, again, th these may be somewhat vague conclusions, but I, I was just looking at uh, the incredible growth of uh, mobile phones linked to banks in Kenya. And right now in Kenya, there are 20 million users of these mobile phones. And you won't believe it, 50% of the GDP transactions are taking place through these mobile phones. So that gives you one example maybe of an area in which uh, Africa could become a leader in, in, in exporting not only, well, the technology is well known, but in exporting the institutional framework that has made, uh, made it such a, uh, a success. So this is it.
um, I'm, I'm open for questions. Africa is likely to be very successful. Uh, my, 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 my own feeling is uh, that in this ICT service sector, it has a role to play. And, and the role it has to play is that it has been able, or many of the countries have been able, to introduce institutions and technologies that have really taken, and taken very, very uh, fast, uh, such as uh, mobile banking in many of these countries. Um, by, by providing a kind of a blueprint to other countries uh, that could benefit of it uh, would be, uh, I think, one, uh, one way of finding the right niche in this uh, global uh, uh, value chain. Um, then there are a number of non-traditional exports that, that people didn't think about in the past because the transport technology was not there, horticulture. Uh, Ethiopia is a major exporter of uh, uh, flowers. I think it may, may well be after the Netherlands, the, the, the second largest exporter uh, of, uh, of flowers. So th th I think there are uh, perhaps new non-traditional exports that could take in the uh, African environment. But again, I, I, I plead guilty because I... I've thought about this question, and uh, I don't really have a very clear answer. And, and, and I know it's somewhat of a cop-out to say, oh, well, they'll find the niche somewhere. But what is happening clearly is that uh, they are not going to follow the industrialization model of uh, uh, past successful uh, uh, countries. Um, uh, the uh, highest likelihood is that uh, uh, it will be a combination of ICT, non-traditional exports, and, and perhaps uh, uh, products that we haven't even been able to think about. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what role do you think a uh, like second uh, green revolution would play in development and possibly finding the green revolution? a second green revolution in Africa? in development and finding the future? Um, I, I think this is, a, this is a good question, but I would be, I would be rather skeptical, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there are so many different uh, topological soil conditions in Africa in contrast with India, Mexico, when the first green revolution came, that to tailor make um, high yielding varieties and, and uh, uh, technologies that could meet these very different conditions um, and, and be profitable, be commercially profitable, that may be the point, uh, is going to be very difficult. You know, you may find a, a technology that works in, in Rwanda, but it may not work in Kenya, and, and you may not have a market that is sufficiently large. Uh, but, but clearly, as uh, agricultural technology improves, it's going to help these countries. <clears throat> and, and recently, the uh, uh, ANU has passed a declaration where it said that uh, agriculture should get 10% of the expenditure budget in each country. Agriculture should grow at 6% a year. I mean, these are pipe dreams. But uh, the point is that they realize the importance of, uh, of agriculture is good news. How about the question of <coughs> the terms of trade? Yeah. But how do they play into this whole thing? Uh, I was reminded by this, that this, I think, in the past few weeks, there's been this big uh, fight between uh, the U.S. and the, <laughs> and uh, Rwanda over tariffs that Rwanda has imposed on second-hand goods, uh, clothes especially. 
And the US has said that uh, they will punish Rwanda for doing that, because that's going to translate into... Well, well I think, <coughs> I think, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's tragic that, that uh, uh, just at the time uh, when we see some of the benefits of uh, globalism <coughs> and, and free trade, uh, that uh, particularly the United States is becoming more and more protectionistic. And of course, this is going to rever reverberate all over the world. And again, it shows that people do not learn from history. Uh, in the United States, uh, we had the Hawley Smoot tra uh, Tariff Act. When was it? In the 20s sometimes. And that was a major reason for the Great Depression because it led to uh, other countries retaliating against the United States. World trade, I think, between 1929 and 1939 shrunk by half. I mean, it's a phenomenal change. Uh, what have we learned from it? Nothing. At least some people haven't learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Professor, what, what I gather from, from uh, in terms of uh, development in Africa is that... I, I have to come. I just... Okay. I'm sorry. Your voice. <laughs> what I gather from the presentation is that the best days of uh, African growth was between 2000 and 2015. Correct. When the GDP per capita reduced and, uh, I mean, increased and, uh, and, the, and the poverty ratio uh, reduced. Yeah. Uh, do you think, I mean, what are some of the factors that uh, precipitated this particular increase? And do you think the Washington consensus had anything to do with it? Because this seems to be a period uh, post the Washington <coughs> consensus. And in terms of Zambia, I think we were... About oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I think I understand the question. The, the, uh, my answer to it would be that there were a number of factors responsible for the quantum jump in economic growth uh, between 2000 and 2015. The, the, the first one was very high commodity prices. That really helped. But there were many others. There is some evidence that the quality of uh, uh, policy uh, improved. Uh, political scientists have all kinds of indicators of the quality of governance and so on. And these indicators showed some improvement in the quality of uh, institutions and uh, uh, basically governance. Still, another factor was an enormous increase in uh, foreign investment into Africa. And here again, there are risks involved because some of this, of course, came from China um, and it's not clear that even though it benefits the short run, it will benefit the long run. Um, and th there are still some, uh, uh, some, some other reasons that can be uh, uh, given. Uh, but right now, commodity prices are low. They are starting to uh, rise again a little bit. Uh, but I am, I am optimistic. I, 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 I'm more optimistic now than I certainly uh, have been in the, uh, in the past. Um, I, I think that uh, um, Africa has a lot of advantage. One thing I didn't say anything about it was a labor force. But in 20 years, Africa will have the largest labor force in the world, the youngest labor force, and in this sense, the potentially most productive labor force. So if good outlets can be found for these new workers, and as the quality of education improves, and I think it is improving in Africa, uh, that could be an enormous force for future economic growth. Whereas in so many other countries, the uh, uh, dependency uh, rate is becoming much higher. Uh, population is aging. Uh, in Africa, we have uh, essentially a creative force in the making. Just a follow-up 
just a follow-up question, uh, Professor. Would you advocate for a blank check opening uh, economy in terms of African states? Quick blank. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, would would you advocate for uh, an open check in terms of uh, uh, market economy? Would would you advocate oh, for uh, an oh, open blank? Uh, you you check? okay? You yeah. ask about Washington consensus. Um, I. I mean, Washington consensus had something to do with it, but th this was at a time when uh, African countries had to put uh, houses in order. Uh, some kind of structural adjustment was needed, but it went much too far. And, and I think that uh, uh, we would now say that uh, uh, many of the policies and, and uh, institutions that have been built are much more flexible than than this this very dogmatic Washington consensus. Any other questions? It's interesting on the on the China relationship because China also has something to do with the rise in price of commodity. Yeah, well, of course. So it's interesting that the reason why the price of foreign the demand in China is foreign. So when China needs more, it goes up. And then, of course, Africa benefits. Yeah. It's a very interesting uh, relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, I know it, it just happened, but I wondered if you have any reaction to the new free trade agreement or the free trade area that, that a lot of African countries have signed in the last OK. I, I think, again, that's a, that's a very good question. And I didn't say anything about it. I, I have a slide somewhere, I don't know if I even showed it, but I said that, that there were two absolutely crucial elements that will be needed to have a successful African development model. One is improved physical infrastructure, roads. The second one is pan-African integration. That is an absolute must. You cannot have how many African countries are there? I don't know, 60 countries, with many of them having artificial borders, uh, with uh, uh, all kinds of, of uh, regulations making it difficult for trade as well as, as people uh, to, uh, to move. This is really a recipe for uh, making economic growth uh, succeed. So I think. Uh, Pan-African uh, integration is, is absolutely crucial. And I haven't followed it closely. I don't know how, how serious they are. I mean, words are easy, uh, actions are difficult, uh, but uh, uh, anything that would improve uh, economic integration, really on all fronts, uh, uh, <coughs> building physical uh, infrastructure, uh, between neighboring uh, countries, uh, making financial transactions easier. I mean, you can name it, would really help uh, growth. I think as Professor Sobek has pointed out, there is no shortage of these institutions in the sense that, <laughs> I mean, I think the issue is really the commitment. You know, how do they realize this? Because they, they've had a Buja Treaty, you know, 19. Yeah. What? Yeah. 1989 or 92. Abuja Treaty was also <laughs> the whole thing yeah. of Africa, one economy. And then you have uh, various regional, ECOWAS, SADIC, you know, <laughs> East Africa. Uh, and the problem that sometimes the countries belong even to multiple <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. groups. I mean, Tanzania, for example, belongs to SADIC, belongs to East African community. And, you know, so there's just really so many of them that we need for rationalization and also commitment to it. Actually, it's a good thing, but it's not real. If you make any progress between the first agreements and now, but what has actually been achieved? Zero. And a lot of it, I think, is, as you say, lack of infrastructure. Because how are you going to trade when you can't actually move your goods to the other place? But an economy which I think is interesting to watch in terms of earning uh, a lot of its uh, money uh, from neighbors is Kenya. Isn't it? Yeah. Because I understand that Kenya now really most of its trade is with the neighbors like Tanzania, Uganda, Uganda, and all that. And, and, Europe. Yeah, and of course, so many African countries 
do not have access to, uh, to the sea. So that makes it much more difficult. And it adds to the transportation cost, makes it much more difficult to export. So I think uh, uh, regional integration is, is, is crucial. Maybe I have a, yeah. nothing fantastic on my side, but I was going to talk about money and uh, monetary policy, particularly uh, how it ties into the Africa's uh, effort and growth. Because when you consider, for instance, the Francophone countries in West Africa are so dependent on Paris in terms of their monetary policy. And also you consider um, in areas like patents and who owns what. It's one area where African states can find a, a niche, but it does appear to be deeply regulated by a global financial regulation instrument. So I was wondering whether you have any comments as to how African states might be able to uh, somehow wriggle out from these uh, strong <laughs> instrumentalities of globalization that makes it difficult for them to even regulate or have firm decisions about their internal monetary policies, like we find in places like <laughs> in places like Togo, demonstrations are going as to uh, who controls their monetary policies. I don't know what could, could, could. Uh, yeah. He's asking about the role of the monetary policy. Like the, the role of what? Monetary. Monetary policy? Policies, yeah. Particularly FRAP. Okay. Yeah. Well, Particularly FRAP. Well, you're giving us an example that, for example, the French West African states, uh, their policies are more or less controlled by France. Yeah, so, I mean, but, but again, that, that is part of, uh, of, of integration. Um, the, uh, uh, the, when you had the, uh, the francophone uh, monetary uh, zone as opposed to the uh, uh, anglophone, this created problems, and for a long time, it kept the francophone countries behind. Then there were, you had the devaluation of the French franc, and that really um, uh, helped. Uh, clearly, uh, some form of integration, uh, monetary integration, is needed. But again, uh, Africa now has the advantage of being able to look at what Europe did, and maybe uh, what should not be done in, in Africa. Um, if you, it, 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 let's say Africa would move in the direction of, of one currency, but at the same time, you would not have uh, an institution that is able to uh, control uh, fiscal policy you're going to have real problems. And this is what, what's happening in, in Europe today. They move too fast in terms of, of uh, introducing the euro, but each country still had control over fiscal policy in their countries, and, and there was a mismatch. So whatever Africa does, and it's a very difficult question, uh, should take into account uh, some of the uh, problems that, that other countries, such as the European Union, have faced. Thank you. And I, I think it's probably too early. Um, the, 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 you have too many uh, uh, countries, too many governments. Um, you don't have the uh, uh, institutions, for instance, um, to have an African Central Bank, I mean, I, I don't don't think this is happening right away. It's it's going to take uh, much more progress in terms of, of greater integration in other areas, such as physical uh, infrastructure. And I think even before we reach that stage, yeah. a lot to be done in terms of making payment systems you know, within Africa. Yeah. Actually, make it possible. It's very difficult to pay money across countries uh, to, to work out the instruments that can affect that. And that in itself would really generate a lot of activity. Uh, very, very you know, uh, difficult in terms of uh, payments across and all that. Uh, and to me, that would be like a first stage. Yeah. You even think of yeah. actually working together. You can pay each other. You know. 
And it was an interesting uh, discussion at the uh, at, uh, uh, African Development Bank, right? Uh, that for example, I mean, they're short of money. I don't know what you, how you react to this. They say they're short of money for infrastructure, that sort of thing, to lend. But that if even say, I mean, the, the African states, in terms of their reserves, uh, you know, they have a lot of reserves. These reserves are deposited in the US yeah. banks. Uh, and they were saying that if they only give them even 1% of that to deposit, uh, some instrument with, uh, with ADB, that will create yeah. a lot of uh, capacity, financial yeah. capacity. Yeah. But then if you talk to an African state to uh, yeah. keep reserves yeah. in Africa, no. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, <laughs> th there's so much. Landmen and, you know, and that's where the money is. There, there's, there's so much to talk about, but there's an incredibly interesting project ongoing in Africa now, which is on financial inclusion. Financial inclusion. And it's a, uh, it's a project, it's a large-scale project, uh, which uh, includes the African Economic Research Consortium and a number of the central banks. Uh, at some stage, I, I, I would love to talk about the role of the African Economic Research Consortium, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's an institution that over 30 years uh, has funded a lot of research in Africa, and it has also produced thousands of economists. Every year, they produce about 200 masters in economics. And what has ha happened is that many of the graduates of the AERC have become important in their countries as uh, governor of the central bank, deputy governor, minister of finance, and so on. So you have very competent, uh, technically competent, and people of, of real integrity in these positions, which you didn't have before. And since they join a common institution where they were trained or where they did uh, research, and since they come together regularly, it's a lot easier for them to be in contact with one another. And I believe that this project on this research project on financial inclusion could help the, the integration movement. Uh,